Welcome back to the WTS, a podcast about makers, artists, and creative people. Jason Hibbs was my second guest on this show way back in July 2021. I didn't realize I was your second guest. Second guest, guest yeah. Wow. yeah. The first one was uh, Shara. Then I, then I had Jason on again later in the year. That was in March of last, that's been almost a year since I had him on with his arch nemesis fighting about river tables. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I thought it would be good to catch up with Bourbon Moth and talk some woodworking. Mr. Moth, welcome back. Thanks for having me, man. Always a pleasure. You know, everybody I talked to agreed that you won that debate against Cam oh, over at, at Blacktail Studio. Yeah. I mean, that was probably pretty obvious. It's not a hard debate to win, you know. Uh, I just had him on the show like a month ago, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, that's cool. He's a nice guy. We text every once in a while. We're, yeah. friend, we're frenemies, you know. Speaking of which, let me get out my notes here. I got actual paper. So, uh, Jason, or I mean, uh, Cam, he prepared a formal statement here. Oh, boy. Here we go. <clears throat> <laughs> Jason did not win that debate. In fact, I embarrassed him. My River Table videos get way more views, and I have a lot more dollar signs in my titles than Bourbon Moth. Well, that's true. He may think that river tables are a fad, but when it comes down to it, what really matters is subscriber count, not the little mm. things like a show on the Magnolia Network. <laughs> wow. You know, he's not hes not wrong. His videos do get more views. It's frustrating. I talk with this with a lot of other YouTubers, and we're always like, what is Cam's deal? How does he do it? I don't understand. It seems like he spends zero time on his thumbnails. He just uh -huh. like grabs a screenshot, doesn't put any title or anything over it, throws it up <laughs> you there. You put dollar signs in them. I guess so. I got to start doing that. I built a you do. $20 table. Yeah, I, I experimented that with a, a, with a short that I did. I forget what the title was, but it wasn't doing anything. And so then I just changed the title and put a lot of dollar signs in it, and it just it went through the roof. People wanted to really? watch that thing. Yeah, well, Might have to try that. People love to see you flexing. Well, I'll have to do that. I uh, just did a, I don't know, six or eight part series building my son a treeless treehouse. And it's obvious that my subscribers are over it by this point. When I post a video, they're like, nah, we're, we're done with this. Um, but I wanted to do one final video showing the entire thing. Maybe I'll just put a bunch of dollar signs in there. World's most expensive treehouse. Right. I don't know. That's it right there. How much it costs you. <laughs> but you know how you write on those multi-part series. It's just, uh, it's just one of those things that it's whenever I see, and it, it doesn't have to be woodworking or anything. It's any channel that has a multi-part series. Those views always go down. Yeah, it's funny because the treehouse is the first time I've ever experienced that. And I've done a lot of multi-part series in the past mm. and they've all, doesn't matter, part one, part two. I've had ones where like part one will get 500,000 views and part two will get a million Really? It's just yeah, it's been the opposite for me, and everybody's like, "Don't do the multi part; they don't do well." Well, up until the treehouse, they were doing fine. So, one time I did a a coffee table build, and I broke it into two parts. And one was the coffee table, and one was the second part was just the drawer. And the drawer video did twice as good as the coffee table. So, oh, see, that was because it was very specific. Yeah, People I guess. Want to so. know how to make drawers? Everybody needs to know how to make a drawer, right? Sure. Yeah. Are you going to get into like home reno or, ne or something next? It, it seems like that's kind of the trajectory woodworkers take. Well, yeah, I feel like everyone does that because at least in my experience, when I started doing YouTube, I was doing home reno, but it was mm -hmm. just my home. Right. So everything was like a project around my house that needed to be done. And YouTube was a good excuse to finally do it. But then you run out of places on your own house. So I feel like the next step, if I was going to be the typical YouTuber, would be to buy a second home and you flip it flip it or something. Yeah, That's real popular right now, yeah. Yeah, but I don't have any plans on doing that right now. The next thing that's coming up that I'm really excited about is about a year and a half ago, two years ago, man, I lost track. Uh, my wife actually found on Craigslist a 1963 Airstream. Oh. And she made me drive all the way to Seattle and pick it up. And I remember <laughs> calling her when I got there to get it. And I was like, are you sure you want me to buy this? It's 
in pretty bad condition and I'm not a mechanic. I don't, I mean, I do woodworking, not aluminum stuff, but she's like, no, it'll be great. I've researched <laughs> it. We can figure it out. So I towed the thing back from Seattle, which is like four hours. The door came unlatched on the way back and like flew open on the freeway and folded in half like a tin can. One of the windows popped out. I got pulled over. It was just a nightmare drive to get this thing back to my house. And I finally get it back and realize there's no way I can do this. It's way out of my wheelhouse. It needs so much work. So I ended up finding a company about two hours from us over in Bend that that's all they do is Airstreams. And they typically do them like from start to finish. But I reached out to them and I was like, I can do the interior, like the woodworking, the cabinetry, all that. Is there any way you could just do everything else and get it to the point where all I have to do is the inside? But they had this, you know, long wait list and were booked way out. So just last month, they finally pulled it into their shop and they're hoping to be done with it in February. So then I can do the fun part, which is all the furniture. The interior. Those are real popular too. People seem to like that. There's people like converting these, you know, making these little trailers into. Yeah, yeah. And when I get it back, I mean, the electrical will be redone, the water. I mean, it'll have a new trailer. They've done everything. So all the stuff that nobody would want to watch anyways. Nobody wants to watch me polish an Airstream for 50 hours. You know, the Airstream people, it's kind of a cult, though, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. like a, it's the only, I think, trailer that has like a fan base. I mean, mm -hmm. people are really obsessed with Airstreams. For sure. Yeah, and the price is crazy on those things. They still make them? I mean, they're, they still Yeah, make they them. make new ones, but from what I can tell, the new ones are kind of like, you know, the Airstream cults are like, oh, you got a new one. <laughs> We don't we don't do that sort of thing around here. The They're aficionados. into the yeah the the vintage ones. I preferred them before they were famous. Yeah, but this piece of junk that I bought that was falling apart and the floor was all rotted out. I mean, there's no way you could use it in its current state, and it was still ten grand for the. Oh thing. no shit! For, yeah. Uh, so how long is that trailer? How how big is it? It's uh, twenty six feet. Is that how how does that compare to other airstreams? Is it like a mid sized airstream? No, I think it's kind of right in the middle. They make them smaller and then they make like 30, 31 footers or something mm -hmm. like that. But I was talking to a friend of mine and he said you don't want one that big because a lot of the national parks and RV parks, they have size limits. And if it's over oh. 30 feet, you either can't get a space or it's really hard to get a space. So oh, 26 that's... seems to be kind of the sweet spot. Do you understand the popularity of air, Airstreams, why they became this iconic brand compared to other travel trailers? I don't. I don't know. I mean, you look at other travel trailers, and whoever does the decoration for other trailers has to – I picture it like some old lady that is stuck in the 1990s. <laughs> and, I mean, all those travel trailers, even the brand new ones, the paint job, the name on it, they got like, you know, cheetahs on the side of them and weird stuff. <laughs> Nobody really does a modern-looking RV <laughs> right. nowadays, it doesn't seem like. Um, yeah. So I think they just look different. You know, they're yeah. round. They're aluminum, so honestly, the body lasts forever. Even this one, even though the body was in bad condition, it's never going to rot or fall apart or anything like that. So it's all riveted together, so you don't have any seams, you know, failing or anything. What are, what are your plans for the interior? Um, well, it's just me and my wife and um, I have one, you know, son. So we're going to try and create kind of like two sleeping areas. Uh, there's going to be a bathroom in there, a little kitchenette. And that's pretty much it. We're also... Hardwoods? Are you, is that what you're kind of going for? Um, we'll have to see. Weight apparently is a big issue when you're doing these Airstream remodels. Oh, you can't put right, too right. much weight in there. Um, so lots of people will use plywood, you know, for cabinets. I think you can put some hardwood in there. You just got to be conscious of how much you got to cut it. everything kind of curved to fit, right? To... You know, I thought that too. In my mind, I was like, oh, when I build cabinets, the back of the, every cabinet is going to have to be curved. But talking to these people that are working on ours, it's all a magic show. You only have to cut one piece that's curved on the end of the cabinets. Everything else is just built like a regular cabinet, and you just put a end cap over the end. Are you just, are you just wasting space then? If it, if I mean a little bit. You're talking just about a little, like it's not that much. inch and a half thing. or something, yeah. They right. have these special brackets that stick out from the wall to meet the cabinet, and then you just kind of put round end caps on everything, and it looks built in when it's not. So right. it'll be fun, though, to figure out. Well, it'll be interesting to see that you going in that direction, at least for a yeah. little while on your channel, huh? 
Yeah, and that'll be a multiple part series, so we'll see how that does. <laughs> I have a theory about woodworking channels and, and like the trajectory that the channels seem to go through. <laughs> see, I think that everybody starts by making small projects, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden people start to watch your videos. Then you hit upon cutting boards. Everybody Ooh. makes cutting boards. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, you know, the, the world, I don't know, but a lot of people still buy cutting boards because there's lots and lots of people selling cutting boards on Etsy and, and whatnot. But then yeah. you hit upon some sort of a thing that people latch onto, like river tables mm. <laughs> or, or like big, big slab coffee tables and things. And then so the people watch those. Then the next step is, you have to you start getting a lot of this sponsored money and you have to move into a bigger shop and get bigger tools yeah <laughs> and so then once you get to, to that stage then then you've got that choice to make you're either going to start renovating a house or you're going to just become like a tool channel where you just do yeah. tool reviews <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sell, no, it's true. sell tools <laughs> yeah it's funny. We should create a like um, game of life board game. But yeah. It's, you know the content creator woodworker edition, <laughs> and you have to choose your path and which direction you're gonna go in. It's, yeah. It is funny. I've um made one cutting board in my entire life, and I did a video on it, and surprisingly, the video did very well for just people being love a cutting, cutting board. boards. <laughs> yeah. People love them. So. Yeah. There's no those guys people... make an entire. Entire careers out of selling cutting boards. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. No, my friend Matt at um, MWA yeah. Woodworking, um, he doesn't do cutting boards anymore. He got so sick of it because he did them just <laughs> oh, forever. Gosh. He was like the cutting board guy, and he got up to, I think, yeah, he well was... over half a million on He had Instagram, some crazy-ass just... designs on those things, too. They were amazing. Yeah, no, his work was really good. But, yeah, he doesn't do them anymore. He's like, no, I'm sick of that stuff. <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's ready to renovate a home now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. No, I think um, it's funny because my wife um, just stopped running a business that we ran for years together, which is a textile printing company. And she shared space with my wood shop. So there's a wall in the middle of my wood shop and she's got another thousand square feet on the other side of the wall. But she's recently decided she wants to kind of take a step back from that and be a mom so now I got this extra thousand square feet on the side of my shop. So, Ooh. you know, in the true woodworking YouTube channel fashion, I'm probably going to have to make my shop bigger and get bigger tools, you know. You got to get a CNC. Are you going to get go digital? No, I'm not going to get a CNC. No. Yeah, I had a CNC and some company sent it to me. It was either Shape. Shapeoko, or I don't remember. <laughs> there was a while where they were sending those out like candy to everybody. Yeah, to everybody. And they were like, you want one? And I was like, <laughs> okay, sure. This was before I was on YouTube. And it shows up, and it's the kind that it doesn't come assembled. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. It comes in pieces, and you have to put it together. I don't know anything about CNC. So I ended up hiring an engineering student at Oregon State University, and he came and set the whole thing up for me. And then he learned how to use it. And I think he used it for like three projects he was working on. Because I was like, if you set it up, you can use it as much as you want. I never used it. I never learned how to use it. And then um, Bits and Bits, the router bit company, mm -hmm. was watching one of my videos. And they saw it sitting in the background. And they live just down the street from me. They're like 45 minutes away. And so they wrote and were like, hey, we really want to get a CNC for our headquarters so we can do social media stuff with our router bits. Would you ever want to sell that CNC? Well, they had just become a Festool dealer, and we ended up just trading uh, the CNC for, you know, its weight and Festool hmm. products. Nice. So I had it in my shop, it got set up, and I got rid of it without ever using it. <laughs> it was kind of a joke a while back where they were giving those out to everybody. I mean, all you had to do was contact them and say, yeah, uh, yeah you know, I posted a, a picture on Instagram once. I'm an influencer. And they would, they would literally just send them out to anybody. Well, it's funny because after I got rid of that one and gave it to Bits and Bits, like a week, two weeks later, they wrote, having forgotten they already gave me one a year earlier. And we're like, hey, we'd love to send you a CNC. <laughs> and I almost just did it because I was like, well, you know, worst case scenario, I'll trade it for some more festival. Yeah, sell it. Just say, well, yeah. just send me the money. We could skip this middle process of me having to sell the thing. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it did be kind of, kind of a joke because there was like this whole bunch of these where people were, one, really frustrated trying to put it together. For, for me, I have no interest in building a tool. 
I don't want to put the thing together. No, yeah. I just want to infuse it. And then there was the other group of people who would finally get the thing together. They would shoot like one video of it and then they just never used it again. Yeah. I think that company though is, I don't think Shape Oko is, I think they think we're something else now. I think they changed. Yeah, you know, I don't think, thinking back now, I don't think it was a Shape Oko. I think it was um, an X Carve. Oh, X Carve, right, right. Was the other one. Yeah, that's what I it think was. That, I, th- I, I could be totally wrong about this, but I think X Carve either bought Shape Oko or Shape Oko. Oh, they were very thing. similar yeah. products. I know that. Yeah, but I've had other people try and give me CNCs. I've got some friends at like Avid CNC before, and they make the really big ones. My friend Justin down the street, who's a YouTuber, he's got an Avid. But that's the thing is I have friends with CNCs, and if I need something, they can do it. And I just feel like CNCs in a YouTube video is boring. Yeah. Is that your main reason? Or, or are you, as a woodworker, just not interested in CNC? No, I have nothing against people that use CNCs, but when I view content, it's I try and make it as relatable as possible. Yeah. And when you're like, okay, next we're gonna go over to my, you know, multi thousand dollar four by eight CNC and cut these pieces out, well, you know, the majority yeah. of your followers can't do they just that. Just drop off. Yeah. Would you yeah. if you weren't creating content, do you think you would use a CNC or are you still with it? Well, if I was still doing client work. Oh, I could see where I would use one, but when I was doing custom furniture, the only reason I would use a CNC would be to make templates for mm-hmm. chairs or that sort of thing. But I have, I do have um, the Shaper Origin, and if you're just cutting one set of templates, that thing is so easy Those to use. Those things are cool, yeah. Doesn't take up a lot of space, so yeah, I'm just not doing production type stuff, which is kind of what CNCs are really designed for. Yeah, there, I, you know, of course, a lot of home woodworkers are using them but to me it just doesn't seem fun as a hobbyist I wouldn't um, I mean that's just me I I don't think I would because it doesn't a lot of the conversation a few years ago was is digital woodworking is it even woodworking and I don't think that's the question to ask I don't think that's relevant because of course it Mm -hmm. is you're making something but to me I've thought so much about that and I, I really think it comes down to the fact that I think that for me, it's because I'm still manually holding the tool and yeah. running it through the machine. Yeah. I'm actually doing something with my hands. Well, and I've seen some pretty uh, crazy stuff done on CNCs. Like, and if you are still using your mind and your creativity to come up with what you're doing on the CNC, I think it's absolutely still, you know, woodworking. If you have a CNC and you're going to, you know, uh, online downloadable plan thing of somebody else's plans that they posted and you're just downloading it and pressing a button to have your CNC cut out, you know, a pre-existing thing. I can see where people would be like, you know, that's not really woodworking at this point. You're not coming up with anything new. You're not, you know, being creative or having to do anything. But I don't know if you're enjoying it. Who cares what people say? Yeah, I had a similar conversation about AI art on my last episode and it's kind of the the same thing is I don't know if eventually at some point you will probably never actually need to walk into a a workshop, a wood shop that, you know, it's inevitable that you could sit at a desk, have artificial intelligence, design something, send it to the machine and then you would just, it would pop out. (laughs) Oh, for sure. Well, it's already, I mean, it's already kind of happening. My brother-in-law, who's a professional woodworker over in Bend and runs a company called Fernway Woodworking. And I mean, he's doing furniture, but not like custom client work. He's trying to develop his entire own line of furniture. And he's actually, I think he might be there right now. He's going over to Italy because he's buying a, it's like a multiple axis CNC that has basically a robot arm. And he's got to go over to Italy to be trained on it because it's so complex. But basically, it's got this robot arm that picks up a blank of wood and holds it and moves the piece of wood while this other router spins at, you know, every angle possible and perfectly cuts out a complex shape and then sets it down, picks up another one. I mean, that is basically watching a robot, you know, do things for you. But his goal is the design. I mean, he's designing the furniture and he's trying to find the most economical way and fastest way to produce a quality product. So... It he makes sense. To, he needs to, eventually he can have AI and he won't have to design it. You just ask the AI, here's what exactly yeah. what the dresser is I want you to make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think some of the, 
and I this is why I think traditional power tool woodworking will never go away for, for hobbyists especially mm -hmm. because I think that with the more and more digital fabrication the more generic things become and they the more perfect they are and it's the flaws in what we make that sort of add value to what mm -hmm. we, we do. And when everything is perfectly cut, I think in the future it will have very little value to it because it was well, like, oh, well, you, can, you can't see the, the saw marks here where a guy was, <laughs> was trying to yeah. fix a mistake or whatever. That's just my take on it. I think that it's all of the digital tools are just going to be perfect for production, mass production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think the way you, it's they're like definitely IKEA. a production thing. And there's things that you can do with them that, you know, you can't do by hand as far as perfection goes. Yeah. But there's also times where, I mean, when I had that CNC in my shop, I'd be building a jig or I'd be building a template, you know, by hand. And people would be like, it's really funny to watch this video of you making a template with a CNC sitting behind you. You could just use that. But for me, it's faster to just do it because... I'm not great on computers. I'd have to spend the time to figure it out, design it in the computer, get it over on the CNC. I'd have to set up the whole CNC to cut it and get my wood in there. And by that time, if I'm making one template, it's pretty much faster for me just to do it, you know? And I think a lot of people today are getting into woodworking to get away from the computer. At least the people I've talked to, who, yeah. you know, Silicon Valley types are like, man, I spend all day coding last thing I want to do is that so I get out to the shop and I make something by hand and it's it's very freeing that way mm -hmm. I would I couldn't sit behind a desk like that it would just bore me to tears <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure no it's funny I was just down in California at uh, Jonathan Katz Moses' shop and we were building a project together and it's this little kids helper stool made out of plywood yeah, I saw those and uh, we used templates to cut out all of our plywood pieces it was just funny because we cut out our templates on his laser, which is right next to his, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar CNC. <laughs> That's a monster. So we cut out the templates with the laser, and then we went and cut out the plywood pieces with the flush trim bit. You know, using the templates. It's just like we could have just cut out the pieces to start with on the CNC, and you know, skipped everything. Yeah. But that wouldn't have made a video. Nobody would have enjoyed watching a CNC cut out some pieces yeah, and screwing it together. True. So. So it was what uh, what were you doing down there anyways? I saw you spending some time with them. Was that your main purpose to work on some templates? And um, Yeah, it was twofold. So we wanted to do a project together. We've been friends for quite a long time. Um, but also we've been doing our own like merchandise distribution for ever. Um, my wife actually was the one printing all of our merchandise and everything. But with her kind of taking a step back from that and just trying to free up more time, uh, Jonathan, we've outsourced all of our distribution to him. So we road tripped down there and took all of our merch and got it set up in his warehouse. So now if you order from us, it'll be through our website, but he's handling all the fulfillment and shipping and all that stuff. So Wow, good for him. Yeah, he does it for a couple different YouTubers. So, What kind of merch are you selling? T-shirts and stuff? Yeah, T-shirts, hats, coffee mugs, stickers, all that. And then um, we are working with him, too, for a few tool designs oh, cool. that we, we got in the hopper that I can't talk about yet because they're Why? top secret. They're Why? top secret. You can tell I me. I talk about them, and then somebody else is going to get it made quicker in China before we even get it on the market. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing it, Steve. Nobody wants to buy that <laughs> Chinese version of a, of a bourbon moth tool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. It's basically a. It's a better way to pour epoxy. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> oh man, you! I, my jaw just about hit the floor there for a second. <laughs> Mm. See, this is why you won that debate. You know, I told Cam he won that debate when he was on the show. Oh, yeah. I I'm know. just, you tell I'm people just what fanning they're... the flames. Yeah, they want to hear. And I should I tell think... you also, his prepared statement was a prepared statement that I kind of, I, I passed it by him. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was written by you. Ben, you'd make a really good journalist. <laughs> so... Yeah, just stirring the pot a little bit. Hey, that's the best part of social media is all the fake feuds between people. <laughs> well, those are more fun. The real feuds are just are just like yeah. And there's I don't think there's really any real feuds in in the maker woodworking nah, community. We don't have to talk about that, but <laughs> I don't know if you could say there's no real feuds. See, I, I'm kind of I feel like I'm out of the loop on some of this stuff. D tell me a real feud. 
Uh, I mean, without like naming any names, I mean, at the <laughs> end of the day, YouTubers and content creators are business people and, you know, other people in that space are competitors. And I definitely have heard where people have, you know, done some not nice things in the name of business to other people. The which, only one I know of was the Odie oil thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, Daniel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a whole thing. I think they both did pretty well off of that one, though. I think yeah. it helped him out kind of. In oh, for way. sure. You, you almost wonder if they planned it ahead of I time. know. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why Cam's getting all those views. and you're not. Uh -huh. But you're still getting really good views on your videos. You can't knock it. And plus, you have those. See, you, you're doing something that I'm starting to do now. I wish I'd kind of gotten on this earlier, is these really long format videos. Mm -hmm. 30 minutes is, is the sweet spot now. Yeah, it's funny because when I first started out, everybody was like 8 to 12 minutes. Yeah. You don't want to go longer than that. Your videos are going to do terrible. Like People are going to lose interest. I just was – it's not like I planned it or I was smart. I'm just not good at editing video, and it's impossible for me to edit stuff down that short. So they always ended up being 25, 35 minutes. But nobody seemed to have an issue with it. They were watching them, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the kind of – YouTube seems to really – promote long format and then of course the shorts but it's those medium ones now the eight to ten minute ones that just die and it's not necessarily and you can't really look at like the view counts anymore it's because it doesn't really matter i can post a 30 minute video and i can get like three times the revenue off of that thing with mm -hmm. just a fraction of the views. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the amount of ads that they can cram into a 30-minute oh. video is a lot more. I know. So I, I'm just trying. If for me, it's the opposite. I've, for so long, I had made those, like, eight- and nine-minute videos that now that I'm making these longer videos, it's actually – it's an interesting challenge to me because I'm doing these narrations, which I've never done before. I've always just talked right to the camera. Oh, yeah. And so I'm trying to work out a better system of doing that. But I find myself having to kind of pad, it, pad them out a little bit. And so I just kind of find things to talk about while the camera's just showing me doing stuff. And people seem to like it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I find it hard kind of to do those narrations after the fact without just saying, and here I am sawing a board. Here <laughs> I am sawing another board. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I just... I've never had an issue with the way I do my videos is I film it, I edit it down. It ends up being as long as it is once I get it edited. I'm just not like I'm trying to hit a target. So sometimes they're 20 minutes, sometimes they're 40 minutes. And then once I have the video all edited, I just watch the video and narrate it in one long take just as I watch the video. And come what may, I mean, I very rarely stop the recording and like go back and re-record something. So in my videos, you'll hear me like, fumble over words or you know say the wrong thing and then have to apologize for it later because i'm like oh you know that wasn't right but i don't know people seem to like that honesty i think yeah so do you get works. a new studio you came out of the closet i'm proud came out of the closet yeah um this last year we built a whole new office building that i'm in right now so this is our recording room i mean you can't That's really nice see it that much but yeah we got this whole it's not very big but you don't want a recording space to be very big so was this the building you built for the so let's get into this tv show business so what happened here this was a, you did a pilot if i'm not mistaken yeah correct. yeah we did a pilot for magnolia network that's a um, discovery channel right One yeah, of the they're discovery. On discovery they're on hbo i don't okay, know, got it a couple different places I'm probably the worst person to talk to about this because I, out of everybody involved in the TV show, know the least about it. I'm the last person to find out anything. Um, we started filming the pilot, man, almost a year ago. And so we've only filmed one episode. It took a long time to film the pilot because we were doing the whole building for one episode, so that took a while. There's a whole other backstory there with the headache we had with contractors and getting the thing built. And then it had to be edited, and then finally Magnolia had to, you know, okay it to be posted, which they did. I was under the impression that it was going to be, like, available everywhere to stream and all that stuff. But I guess that's not the way pilots typically work. It's old media, man. It's old media. I guess. They so have a they hard time. put it on live TV, which is still a thing, believe it or not. <laughs> You're kidding. I didn't know that network was a live TV show. Well, I mean, I guess not live, but, um, like, cable, you know, like a time oh, okay. slot. Yeah. Which, 
who has cable anymore? <laughs> I don't. That's a problem. I mean, some of these things are just hard. They make it kind of hard to find, don't they? Yeah, no, they did make it really hard to find. And it was a little frustrating because they said they were going to air it. They gave me the air date and they gave me the time. I thought that then it was going to be available at that time on all their streaming platforms. So uh, they wanted me to do a little, you know, teaser post on YouTube. So I put together a little video and that date came around. They aired it once during that time slot. And I think it's aired a few more times on cable since then. But everybody on YouTube was so angry because nobody can find it anywhere. No, Everyone's like, it's not on Magnolia. It's not on Discovery. So, Do you think that these TV shows are starting to panic a little bit? And that's why I think so. They're reaching out to YouTubers and it never, I, I hope yours works, but it just seems to be this pattern of YouTubers trying to television and it's not a good fit because it's just, a, it's two totally different formats and oh for sure and it's not i mean to be completely honest it's not worth it the tv did they pay you a lot how much they pay you no i mean i can make way more money (laughs) on youtube (laughs) and reach more people and reach more people yeah Yeah. i was actually looking at the magnolia stats the other day and i get more average views on my youtube videos than they do on most of their tv shows (laughs) well because nobody's heard of magnolia yeah i don't know how these networks are still surviving to be honest well, you know how they survive, and I don't know if this is still the case, but for a while it was because of cable TV and they would because they would sell packages. So they're not a la carte, so nobody would buy just Magnolia or just Discover. You'd have to get the whole cable package, and so they sort of spread the, spread the wealth that way. But now with everything going more towards streaming... I think that that's going to change. You got it, but still, I think everything. Yeah, well, I think the future is that networks are going to wise up and realize, hey, we've been doing this completely wrong as far as like we've been approaching these YouTubers and trying to do a traditional TV show around them. Where what they should be doing is approaching YouTubers and saying, hey, you already are doing all of the work for us. Let's license your content and put it on our network. And there's some networks that are already doing that. I have a licensing deal with this old house that's done exactly that. They've reached out to a bunch of makers, yeah. and all they're doing is licensing their content and putting it on their network, and it seems to actually be doing pretty well. Is it on the, the this old house? That, see, there's another one. That used to be PBS, and I have no idea how to watch PBS anymore. Is that is it yeah, on, so the, online? Yeah, they have a streaming platform, so you can actually stream oh, that okay. stuff. I think it's through Roku. But yeah. now it's on like Samsung TV. It's there's like twenty different streaming platforms that I've never heard of. I mean, there's like so many out there nowadays. But I think that's the smart play because for them, for like Magnolia to come to me and want to do a TV show, right? They have to pay me. Granted, not very much to do the TV show, but then they have to pay a full camera crew. They have mm-hmm. to pay to fly people out. They have to pay. You they have know, to make a huge deal out of something that doesn't need to be a huge deal because we've we've known how to do this for years. Sure. So by the end of the pilot, they're spending, you know, hundreds, thousands of dollars to do yeah. one TV show. Where if they approach a YouTuber, which YouTube <laughs> like is I could do it for a hundred bucks. Well, yeah, YouTube's getting better and better as far as filming quality and that sort of thing. Um, they already have the content. Yeah, they're going to be in it for a fraction of the price and yeah, just be able to license it. And... You don't need that overhead. And and like your videos, the, the quality on the videos that you produce is just as good, as I think, as TV. It doesn't have that traditional kind of TV cadence and look about yeah. it. But that's what makes YouTube videos different. Not It's not TV. Well, and that is by design. We could. I mean, we're a big enough channel. We could afford to hire a professional videographer with all the latest, fanciest equipment and come in and, you know, set things up with the lighting and get all these crazy shots and make it feel more like a TV show. I don't think it would do as well. I think Mm. there's something to be said for especially our, like, kind of DIY space that when people look up a video on how to do something, they want it to be very relatable and feel like they could do it. And the second you have this super curated, you know, high production quality video – I feel like it intimidates a lot of people right off the bat where every one of our videos is literally me in my shop with an iPhone. So, That's yeah. it. That's and amazing. I think there's something relatable about that. So I don't think we're going to change. Everyone's like, when are you going to switch to a real camera? Yeah, um, I get that too. Never. Yeah. <laughs> Did you meet the Chip and Joanna Gaines? 
Um, no, not through the TV show. I have met Joanna before um, in a completely different regard. So the printing business my wife and I ran for a long time, um, she was actually one of our very first wholesalers that started carrying our stuff in her store. And this was way back before she was on, you know, Magnolia TV and that whole show. She just had a little shop in Waco, Texas. So she would call me once a month and place an order over the phone. So I'd talk with her for like a half an hour and, you know, hand write out her order and everything. And I didn't know what she looked like. I remember listening to her. And you know, you kind of put a face with people's voice inadvertently. And in my mind, she was kind of an overweight, blonde, <laughs> southern woman. It's like totally different. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then yeah. when the TV show came out, I was like, hey, I know her. And she is not at all what I, <laughs> what I thought she looked like. Well, so now, kind of, of course, they've got a billion dollar. You know, they live in a castle, a freaking castle now, I think. Yeah, well, they have a castle. Whether they actually live I there, don't I don't know. But they don't do have they a do. castle. See, yeah. and that's just the thing. That's <clears throat> To me, that's the difference between TV and YouTube is that their shows are not about relatability because mm -hmm. the stuff you see on these design shows, it's always these people, all these home flipping shows. They'll flip a home, you know, in a, in a half hour segment. And you watch these guys on YouTube who are, who are renovating homes and it's a long process. And you can yeah. see all the things that are being done. And then on these shows, they always show, you know, how much money they're making off of it. And I think that's a big, big difference between TV and YouTube. Mm -hmm. I don't think TV can overcome that. I have a theory that TV has done an amazing job at tricking people into watching long form commercials. <laughs> and so true. I keep, I keep asking myself, like, how are they actually making money? And I think it's because, like, the show Fixer Up or Chip and Joanna's show. I think you're really just tricked into watching a long form commercial. And then you go to Target and you buy their line of home goods and you buy the Magnolia magazine and you buy all this other stuff that they're able to sell because of their TV show. So when they look at it, I don't think they're like, man, the TV show is what we're going to make money off of. No, they're like, because of the TV show and we can get enough people to watch this commercial, we can sell all this other stuff on yeah. top of it. I did a little bit of TV a number of years ago, and I just found it, it very frustrating, just the amount of fussiness that they put into oh, everything. Yeah. It's like, God, I would never do all of this. And all of the, the weird things like covering up the the logo on my shoes, and you mm -hmm. know, it's like they're so... They're so worked up about this stuff. My like, God damn. Well, like, like part of this show, that the pilot we did, um, in the pilot I built a table for the new office space. And I would have to cut like the pieces for the legs. So they'd get the camera all set up and they'd get the lighting all perfect. And I'd cut all the pieces for the legs. And then they'd be like, all right, that was great. We're going to move the camera, reset the lighting. We want you to do it again. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, no, I... I cut all the pieces for the legs. I can't <laughs> do it again. There's no more keep, you know, there's nothing else to cut. Oh, it's fine. Just cut some wood. Just fake it. Nobody will know. And I'm like, this wow. is total bullshit. <laughs> like, are they gonna? Are you? Do you think they're gonna come back to do more of it after this pilot, or is it? I would don't you do know. More? Um, well, unfortunately, and maybe it was foolish. I, you know, signed a contract that if it gets picked up, I'm, you know, committed to a certain number of episodes. Oh, wow. I think I might be able to get out of that if I really wanted to. Um, I don't know if it'll get picked up. I don't even know if I should be talking about it this truthfully. I might get myself in trouble, but it's definitely not worth it. <laughs> it's what I'm here business, for. It's not yeah. worth it from a business or, you know, financial standpoint at all. They like to whisper in your ear like, yeah, you're not getting paid very much money from the show, but uh, because of the show, you'll be able to market yourself in all these other ways. That's such, and, that whole, it's like don't pay artists, but, you know, I'll give you exposure. Yeah. Exposure, yeah. no, because... And everybody I've talked to who's done television, they say that those two things don't relate. Nobody no. comes to your YouTube channel from the TV show, and it hardly works the other way other than yeah. curiosity people. At this point, I think the only thing I would get out of it is when I'm old and, you know, talking to my grandkids, I could be like, I was on a TV show one day. But they'll, they'll probably be like, look at me oh, and be like, what's TV? I know. <laughs> well, see, what do that's you mean, the thing. A TV it's show? like you what can tell that? somebody... Hey, I was on a TV show, and the reaction you'll get is, oh. But if you say, oh, I've got a YouTube channel, the reaction is, oh. 
Yeah, exactly. It's really a lot different now, except for maybe a, a certain demographic. But I think that these TV shows try to sell the talent on the fact that it's like got some sort of panache to it still. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's funny when people find out about the TV show, the different reactions. Anybody 30 years old or younger is kind of yeah. like, oh, cool, like big deal. Anybody like, you know, 40 or older is like, oh, my gosh, you're going to be millionaire. You're going to be so rich. <laughs> and it's like, no, if this would have happened 15, 20 years ago, it would have yeah. been a way bigger deal, I think. But now I feel like everybody has a TV show. Well, especially when you just look at the numbers, you look at how many people watch your videos on a yeah. regular basis and how much money you can make off of that compared to the TV. It, it hardly compares. Well, and there's, I mean, there's just so many other things too. Like I, for, you know, over a month had to film this pilot and I had to show up at a certain time and I had to do what I was told and I couldn't wear certain things. And I very much was an employee of a system where when I'm doing YouTube, I can go into my shop and do absolutely anything I want to do. Or nothing. I can say what I want to do. I can show up and work when I want to show up and work. I mean, it's just the freedom involved there. There's just so many benefits to YouTube versus TV that it's just ridiculous. Why am I doing this? I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about the, the thing you built though, that this house. So this is a, a is it like a guest house or, a, or an office building? Is that yeah, what? it's a, I mean, basically it's our office building for okay. the channel. So we have, so you've got, and this is all on your property there. You've got your house, you've got the playhouse or the, the tree house, and then you've got this structure. Yeah. Yeah. So property in Oregon is a little different than property in California. Um, we we actually have space to build things and do stuff on it. Um, yeah, so the sh- new shop is it's where a greenhouse used to be in our garden. So we tore down the greenhouse and we built a little bit bigger footprint office building. So it's a cool building. It was a lot of fun to design it. And we made it, you know, a little more extreme because of the TV show. So it's got mm-hmm. some cool features. It's got a little, you know, loft space in it. And then, then there's a ladder from that loft space up to a third loft space that's kind of like a little crow's nest for my son to go hang out in and Neat. on the second story there's a big glass garage door that opens up onto a balcony i mean it's a cool building but we pretty much use it to sit there's like a seating area we sit there and edit videos on our phone and ipad and record in the recording booth that's basically all we use it for how does building construction compare to your woodworking experience do you prefer one to the other Um, Well, so I didn't do a lot of the actual construction on the building. We hired that out. I did uh, most of the finishing work on the side. But you've done the construction on the treehouse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine Um, that's similar. Yeah, I like it a lot, actually. You can, I mean, the speed at which you can do things seems a lot faster. I did have to remind myself at the beginning when I was doing the framing and I was trying to get all the framing within like a 30-second of an inch (laughs) accuracy. You got to throw that out. And I had a friend who was helping me who's done framing, and they were getting very frustrated and were like, you don't understand. It doesn't <laughs> – like if it's within a quarter of an inch, we're probably fine. And that was a foreign thing to me. So, um, I mean, I almost wanted to like not use framing nails and domino all the walls together. But <laughs> that would have been ridiculous. So I had to like learn. You can, you know, you can do things a little, you know, sloppier and faster, and that's okay because it all gets covered up. But it was fun. Yeah, I could see doing more projects like that in the future. I would love to buy a piece of land sometime and build like a cabin. I think that would be really fun. You mean like a log cabin? No, probably not a log cabin. More, you know, modern, not a modern cabin, but using modern building practices. But See, I've got this idea I wanted to do is I really want to buy a place in the city and renovate it. I think that not a lot of people do that, at least, mm. at least on YouTube. I don't yeah. think I would do really do much of a YouTube channel, but I just want to have a, a place in the city. I think it would be nice. Yeah, that would be cool. There's um, what's um, Mike from Modestrial Maker. Do you follow him at all? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. His whole you know warehouse complex that he bought in Chicago that he's been working on. Pretty cool. Where do you see yourself in, in the next few years? Doing more of this large scale construction, or do you, do you want to get back to smaller projects? Right now, I want to get back to smaller projects. I mean, for the last few months, it seems like I haven't even been in my shop. I've been out in our pasture working on this treehouse. So I'm really looking forward, especially now that it's wintertime and the weather's nasty, getting in the shop and just working on small items. 
I mean, the whole way I got into woodworking was, you know, custom kind of more fine furniture, and I'd love to get back to some of those projects. So this week we're working on a whiskey cabinet, so that'll be fun because that's never been done on YouTube before. <laughs> well, you make, make some cutting boards to put on top of it. Oh, you know? perfect. What is a whiskey cabinet? How does it differ from other cabinets? Oh, you know, you put whiskey in it. <laughs> you can do that in any old cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> um, the whole reason I'm building this cabinet is I had a really cool idea for cabinet door fronts with kind of a wood pattern in it um, that I don't even know if it's going to work. And it's too complicated to try and explain. So I was trying to explain it to my employee and he's like, I'm just going to have to see it. I don't understand a word you're saying. But I needed something that needed a cabinet door to try this technique out. So it's kind of going to be an experimental video. We'll see if it works. I don't know. But those ones are fun because if it fails, it's just part of the video. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, people love that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then you can do the big, like, <gasps> shocked face, like, my <laughs> biggest failure yet. Yeah, I almost ruined everything. Yeah. yeah. I've just got a project right now I'm working on, right? It was really dumb. I needed to do these little cutout pieces before gluing them in, and I glued them in. I totally forgot about doing the cutouts, and now i got to come up with a solution for it. But I kind of mm. like doing that stuff, really. I like problems like that that come up. And my it's kind of funny because my first thought, I think it's probably everybody's first thought is, oh, crap, I got to start all over. I got to. But if I just stop and think and I think, well, there's probably a way to fix this. There's probably a way that I could solve mm. this problem. That's you know, what I like. on like problem solving and TV shows, I had, I think it's a great idea. If you wanted a hit successful TV show, I came up with an idea. It's called DIYers in a Ditch, okay? <laughs> um, and basically what the show is is not so much a ditch, but you have a bunch of holes that are, let's say, 12-foot circular holes that are 25 feet deep, just these big holes. And in the bottom of each hole, you put a you know known DIYer content creator and uh, some basic tools and a pile of wood. And the first person to get out of the hole <laughs> wins $25,000 or whatever. And then at certain stages in the hole, the higher you get, there's other things that could help you. Like there's a certain tool just out of reach at like, you know, 10 feet or whatever. Well, this is kind of cool. Everybody has to individually use the materials in their hole to try and create some stairs or ladders, some sort of system to get them out. But there's not quite enough material. So you got to get really creative. And whoever gets out of the hole first wins. I'd watch that. You know what I would do is I would I would wait for the person. I, I would just start digging towards one of the other holes. Oh, and just then tunnel to the other hole. Whoever's doing it really well and almost to the top. And then you get into their hole and then you just fight them to the death and then climb up out. Using yeah, you their... use the nail gun just to kill them and then <laughs> climb out. <laughs> I want to watch that show. Yeah. yeah, see, TV, that's what we need. You, know, you had a video on your channel a while back about... And I, I remember it said, don't buy wood from Home Depot or how to how to shop for lumber or something. Know, to be fair, I never mentioned Home Depot in that entire video. <laughs> no, but it was it was blurred <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever shop at, at any of these big box retailers? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Um, not for like hardwood for furniture <laughs> or plywood for, you know, cabinets. But I mean, yeah, I go to Home Depot all the time to get yeah. fasteners and various things that they're great for. And I even say in the video, you know, Home Depot is great for certain things. When I was doing the treehouse, I bought a ton of stuff there, but that's kind of what it is for, is for construction. Yeah. But you yeah. have all these people who are sending, I mean, maybe you get this, like you get messages of like, I built this coffee table and now there's all these gaps and it's warped. Like, what did I do wrong? Well, you bought wet Crap. wood at Home Depot, you know. Yeah. So I tried to do that video to show there's other options. It's funny, that was one of those videos that was on my list of possibilities for a long time. And I always thought like, if we run out of stuff to do, this would be a good quick extra. It's not gonna do well, but it would give us a video if we really need one. And that video is gonna hit a million views here in the next That's week, crazy. I mean. Yeah, I had a video on how to shop for lumber at the home center, some tips. It's kind of yeah. like, you know, you're, you're basically on your own when you go to at least, the Home Depot near where I live is just, it's a horrible, miserable, you know, hellscape of a store to try to shop. Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. Well, nobody knows what they're talking about there. I remember oh. one person was telling me that they went in there and asked one of the, you know, orange 
apron people like, hey, do you guys sell liquid nails? And the person was like laughing at them like, yeah, good one, buddy. And they're like, no, like liquid nails. And they're like, I'm not like basically like walked away. Like I'm not going to waste my time with you if you're going to just joke with me. Like, of course, we don't have liquid nails here. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's pretty much my experience with Home Depot. But we've got a good hardware store locally, which I go Mm. to most of the time, especially for fasteners. I love a good hardware store that has all these little drawers of, and you can oh, buy just yeah. like two That's or my three favorite. screws. I, I love yeah. that sort of thing. Because you go to Home Depot and then you wind up with this mystery drawer in your shop. Everyone's got it. And it's all the remaining like three fasteners left in the bottom of the box or <laughs> right. the washers or the nuts or, you know, all the random things that you end up with because you had to buy an entire package. Or if you can just go to the hardwood store and buy exactly the, That's right. you know, amount that you need, it's nice. Do you have a strategy for dealing with excess hardware, all these nuts and bolts and stuff? Do you are you one of these that like puts them in a can or a jar and just like a hundred thousands of these little pieces? Yeah, I told you I have a mystery drawer. It's one drawer. Put them all. Yeah, well, it's like overflowed into two drawers. I do have all my fasteners very organized by really? size and shape and all that. Yeah, I did a video on like a fastener storage slash uh, drill charging station. And they're all organized. And amazingly, I've kept them that way for a year now, which usually I start out really organized. And then over time, it gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. But one of my favorite things to do now is to, like, fill up my fastener thing so they're all nice and full. <laughs> it's the worst when you need a specific size fastener and mm-hmm. you don't have it. And you can't really make another one work. It's going to be too long or too short. And you got to run out just to get screws. That sucks. You're not going to dig through the junk drawer of all the fasteners or all the... No, I do a lot of the time try and do that, but sometimes you just can't find what you need. Well, yeah, I find myself like, I don't know what it is. It's some sort of a mania that prevents me from throwing away the extra pieces. Like you'll build something, you know, a, a towel bar or something that you, you install and it comes with an extra screw and I'm like, well, I better save that. Yeah, you never just know. in case. Yeah. <laughs> Someday I may need this weird Allen wrench because well, everybody has thrown those types of things away and then the next day something happens and you could have really used it and you're like yeah. never again <laughs> never again am i gonna get rid of that <laughs> same with same with allen wrenches because those come with like ikea and anything you oh, build yeah. and i always think well it's a tool I, I guess i should save it but i've got a billion of them not to mention i've got a complete set i don't yeah. need to save these extra ones but i do see i draw the line at the allen wrenches i don't save those because yeah i Toss do them. i have probably like three sets and you got the little like fold out like pocket knife style ones laying yeah. around so <laughs> yeah you got to throw this stuff away, don't you? It's just going it, to, it'll, it'll take over your entire life, all this stuff. Yeah, I would say probably twice a year we do like the great purge, purge of our shop and we go through and throw a lot of stuff away. Or we give a lot of stuff away. Every month or so we do these maker meetups up in Portland with like local makers. So I'll kind of create piles and take it up there and M- then make they it, can store it in their shop. <laughs> make it, it become somebody else's <laughs> yeah. problem. Exactly. I think that's one of the biggest questions I get is how to deal with scrap lumber. Do you have a system? Do you have like a, a size limit or how do you deal with it? Man, I'm brutal and ruthless when it comes to the keeping scraps. If It has to be pretty big piece for me to keep it. If not, I burn it. And I'm sure that people don't like that. And I've gotten hate in videos because I show me burning it before. But <laughs> you don't understand. Like, I just don't build small stuff. Well, and then yeah. I have people that are like, well, you could save that and sell it to somebody that does. Well, I don't have the time or, you know, I'd have to the logistics of figuring that out and finding somebody. I mean. I do the same thing. I have a purge every year. And usually what I'll do is I take all the excess lumber. I'll put it on the curb and I'll put a free add on craigslist it's just free lumber and take it and sometimes that works and i'm not going to go crazy if nobody takes i'm just going to throw it away but you have to because what i've noticed is you'll keep small pieces and you think well maybe that'll come in handy for something but it really doesn't because if you needed a board like that it's probably you're probably going to be building a project where you're going to want all of the wood to sort of match and that one's probably not going to match so it's yeah. not going to really be used for a project. You're going to buy wood just for that project anyways, creating more yeah. 
scrap lumber. <laughs> so just, There's certain yeah. small pieces that I've kept in the past. Like somebody gave me a chunk of like African ebony, you know, yeah. and that's a smaller piece, but it's really expensive wood. Or when I was building my drift boat, somebody sent me a piece. This is probably illegal. Um, but their grandfather worked at the USS Constitution Museum, hmm. old Ironsides. Yeah. Um, and they had to redo some of the decking on the ship. And he sent me a piece of the original boat. And I put part of it inlaid into my boat. And there was a little, you know, piece left over. Well, I felt like I can't throw this away. George Washington could have stood on this piece of wood. I can't, like, just burn it. So I have that little scrap piece. But those, are, I mean, are like the few exceptions where I'll save small pieces of wood. Well, and sometimes you get something that's real exotic or rare, and then you can't never find anything that justifies using it. So it just sits around. Yeah, it's like exactly. it's too good to use for anything. <laughs> yeah. Would people watch your videos? What What do you want viewers to gain from Bourbon Moth overall? You can't say inspiration. Don't say inspiration. Everybody no, says not that. inspiration. I would say above like knowledge or learning or anything like that, um, just entertainment. And honestly, the thing I've noticed with our channels and just, you know, looking at other people's channels, and maybe this isn't true, just an outside perspective, but I just feel like we have such a loyal subscriber base. I mean, we have quite a few subscribers, but they seem very loyal in their watching of our videos to we're at the point where I can post a video and we're pretty much guaranteed, even if it's a terrible video, um, around 200,000, 300,000 oh, views yeah. in the video. Um, and those are just, I you know, equate it to our loyal subscribers. And it's not so much that they even care about what we're posting, but they it's know you. the video is going to be entertaining. Well, they're and watching them, because of you. Yeah, and to them, this is just like, you know, a TV show that you wait every week, you know, for a new episode to come out. It's the same thing. It's just on YouTube. So as long as we can keep people entertained, I don't think the content really matters as much, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, that's a good outlook. I think that a lot of people on YouTube don't understand that equation. I think that's yeah. really important. You've got to be entertaining because there's plenty of good woodworkers who are doing amazing work that just can't find traction on YouTube. When I feel like the typical YouTube mindset of other people, and I try and, you know, talk people out of this mindset, is where they're constantly hunting down their next viral video. Yeah. Like yeah. they want every video to be a million, three million, ten million views. And so they end up putting out a lot of garbage that gets, you know, 30 to 60,000 views. And then every once in a while they have this spike and one will take off and they'll, you know, find that magic thing. And then they're constantly like searching for it again, where honestly, I don't care if we get million view videos. I'd rather have a bunch of videos that are getting two and 300,000 views consistently than like a huge spike every once in a while. Yeah, I think that's way, way better. Those viral videos don't really do you much good anyways. No. It's the same with the shorts. I mean. I haven't really done too many shorts lately, and, and I think it's a lot of that. It's just they don't really – doesn't really add much to your channel. No, yeah. So we just try and stay consistent, you know, make sure everything's on brand and cool. entertain people. You going to be at uh, Workbench Con? Yeah, buddy. Are you going to be there? It's the first time ever, yeah. I finally oh, decided nice. to go. Yeah, you'll have a good time. I just got The conference is – um, eh. Yeah, everybody says that. I don't. I just want to meet up with everybody. Yeah, I, I know yeah, really. Because I know, it's really, it's I know everybody, event. and I think yeah. it would just be fun to, to finally catch yeah. up. With if you're going there for the conference alone, you might be disappointed. But if you go there as like, hey, this is a great opportunity to see everybody yeah. that I follow and hang out and talk in person. Well, it's a great time. Yeah, we gotta have a big meetup. Oh yeah. You, me, Cam. <laughs> well, it won't be hard. I mean, everybody's just there, and the, yeah. You know, the hotel lobby becomes kind of the hangout place down sure. by the bar. And then around midnight or 1 o'clock, the hotel staff has to come shoo us out. Like, you guys are being too loud. Go to bed. <laughs> so then we go over to Waffle House until, like, you know, 2 in the morning or whatever. <laughs> the, the, the Waffle House. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jason, it was great talking to you again. Yeah. Thanks for having me.